The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When the days for Jesus' being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, Let the dead bury their dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. To him Jesus said, No one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. When I go over to our other church in Newmarket every week, I always take Exeter Road through Newfields. It's a quick little way to go. It's very little traffic. It only takes 15 minutes. It's really the way to go. But if you plug Newmarket into your GPS, it will tell you that you can also take Portsmouth Avenue, which uh, might even look a little bit quicker on the map, but with anyone with just a little bit of experience can tell you there's like 50 traffic lights along Portsmouth Avenue with all the stores there, and so you really don't want to go that way. Well, you can imagine my shock when a few weeks ago we were headed over there for a confirmation mass for, uh, with the bishop and uh, seminarian Spencer, who's very eager but also very inexperienced, he decided he was going to drive. And he invited me and Deacon Eric and Fred came. We were all in the car. And instead of going down Exeter Road, he started going down Portsmouth Avenue. And I said, Spencer, what are you doing? It's rush hour. This is going to take forever. And he said, no, no. Look at my GPS. It says it's going to take just as quick to go this way. It's really not that bad. Well, God help us. We hit every single red light along the way. And what, uh, we had left like an hour early. I almost had to call the bishop to tell him we were going to be late for the mass. That's how long it took to get over there. Well, I know, I'm telling you, sometimes I feel like Elijah dealing with little, young Elisha, trying to make him a prophet. Or I, I feel like Jesus with these inexperienced disciples. They're eager, but they, they don't know what they're doing. And, you know, there's Jesus today. He's about to start a journey as well. Jesus is going to journey from his home region up in Galilee down to Jerusalem, to the big city in the south. And this is not just any journey. This is the most important journey that Jesus is ever going to make because he is going down to Jerusalem to die on the cross for us, to give his life to set us free. This is a pretty important journey. And so we hear that Jesus resolutely sets his face to Jerusalem. He figures out where south is, and he faces south, he faces that way, he puts the coordinates into his mental GPS, and he starts walking in a straight line. And nothing is going to stop him from getting to his destination, no matter how hard the journey gets. The only problem is that if you go from Galilee in the north down to Jerusalem in the south, right in between is the country of Samaria. And as we hear over and over again in the Gospels, the Samaritans were the hated enemies of the Jews. What most Jewish people would do if they wanted to make that journey at that time is they would take a route that looked a little bit longer on the map, but was actually a much better route to go down the Jordan River Valley, down to Jericho, and then up to Jerusalem that way. And it looks a little bit longer, but it's going to save you a lot of grief if you go that way. But, and sure enough, we hear what happens when Jesus just tries to go straight through Samaria that there's a solid red light outside of every village. Jesus, stop. We don't want you here. 
we, you're not welcome in this village. And there's all these horrible things that start happening. Now, what's going on here? Is Jesus just inexperienced? Does he not know the, the better route to take down to Jerusalem? Or was he getting bad advice from his apostles? Or maybe, as usual, Jesus was two steps ahead of everyone else. That by going this straight and narrow way through Samaria, through what could be considered enemy territory, Jesus was trying to teach his disciples and us a lesson. That the easy way is not always the better way. That sometimes the better way in life is the harder way. It's the way of the cross. It's the way that leads to Jerusalem, to that place where Jesus is going to be crucified and rejected and mocked. It's hard to remember that sometimes. It's easier to go to places where we're accepted and celebrated and everyone likes us and everyone agrees with us. It's a lot harder to go to a place where we're going to face opposition and difficulty and things might not go our way. And yet that's the way of the cross that Jesus invites us to. Pick up your cross every day and follow me if you want to be my disciple. And how many disciples will follow Jesus as long as it's easy? Jesus, show me the, the path of least resistance and I'll follow you there. But as soon as the way gets difficult, we start looking around and saying, well, Jesus, you know, couldn't there be another way that I could take? The one thing I have to say about the Portsmouth Avenue way to Newmarket is that it is more interesting because of all those stars, stores and restaurants along the way. And, you know, it's a long journey to Newmarket, and sometimes you get hungry along the way. And so you might want to stop at the McDonald's or the ice cream place there, you know. And, and, and there's all these new things happening along Portsmouth Avenue all the time. Last summer, there was this building being built right next to the Starbucks. And I said, oh, there's going to be something really good going in there. And actually, Deacon Eric told me that he heard a rumor that there was a Chick-fil-A going in there. And I said, well, I love Chick-fil-A. This is great. This is wonderful. Well, it turned out that a Chipotle went in there, which I thought was a waste because there was already two other Mexican restaurants along the way. But, and, you know, another broken promise from Deacon Eric. You know, he's always, <laughs> he's always disappointing. I was just very disappointed. And... Then this summer, right across the street, there was another big building going up right next to the market basket. And every time I go by this summer, that building keeps getting bigger and bigger, and they're clearing land. And I say, oh, this is going to be something amazing. Maybe they're building a whole new market basket. Or maybe the Chick-fil-A is finally going in there. Well, I, I saw the sign the other day. It turns out it's a dermatology office going in there. So another disappointment, another broken promise. And yet, you know, if you go that way, it's okay. You'll, you'll have what you need. I mean, I can have Mexican three times if I want, all the way to Newmarket. Well, this seems to be the mindset so often of disciples. I mean, look at the eager, young disciples who come up to Jesus today and say, Jesus, we want to follow you. We want to go to Jerusalem with you. And, and we're going to go wherever you lead. But just to be clear, Jesus, like, there is going to be a Chick-fil-A along the way, right? Because, you know, it's a long journey to Jerusalem. We might get hungry along the way. If not, maybe I'm going to go back and pack a lunch before we continue. Or, and Jesus, just to be clear, like, we're going to have some comfortable lodging, right? Every step of the way. Like, uh, you know, I, I, maybe I should go back and get a pillow or a sleeping bag so I have somewhere to rest my head. And Jesus says, no. It doesn't work that way. I can't promise you all of that. I can't promise there's going to be a Chick-fil-A or a restaurant wherever you want. In fact, the road is going to be difficult. And you can't keep looking here, there, and everywhere for the things you want. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and keeps looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And I can't promise you you're going to have somewhere comfortable to lay your head every night. The foxes have their dens, the birds of the, the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And this is a challenging lesson. I have to give Jesus credit. At least he doesn't fill us with false promises. At least he doesn't say, oh, everything is just going to be great if you follow me. No, he's very clear right up front. There are a lot of consolations that come with discipleship. But there are a lot of challenges as well. It's a difficult journey sometimes to follow Jesus and to go all the way to Jerusalem. 
And we have to be more like Jesus in some times and just resolutely set our face to Jerusalem and keep going even when the road gets difficult to pick up our cross every day and follow Jesus. And it's, it's hard to do. At least Jesus does, doesn't promise us ease and comfort when he can't promise us those things. And in a culture that so often values ease and comfort, sometimes above almost anything else, that's a hard sell. It's a hard sell in our culture today to convince people to follow Jesus. Or even just look at the many responses to the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade this week, that it's hard sometimes. We, we don't want to hear all the time that the easy road is not always the best road. That with our God-given ability to choose this great gift of freedom that God gives us, the ability to choose this way or that way, we, we also have a responsibility to choose the right way, to choose the way that leads to life. And that as we journey with one another, we're not just responsible for ourselves. I'm looking out for my own pleasure. I'm looking out for my own ease. We have to take care of one another. We have to take care especially of people who are vulnerable, people who are hungry, people who have no shelter, people, children, born and unborn, mothers and fathers who are in need. We have an obligation to take care of one another so that no one's tempted to go the wrong way. And as we journey along the path, we have an obligation to listen to one another, to have enough humility to say, maybe this person I'm journeying with can teach me something. I can learn from them. It's easy to call down fire from heaven with, to people like the disciples try to do in their inexperience, but Jesus says, no, have the courage sometimes to go into what you might consider enemy territory and spend some time there. Get to know them. Spend time in that village. Sit down and eat with them. And you can bring God's love into that situation, but God's love can come back to you as well. And this is what St. Paul says in our reading too. For freedom, Christ set you free. So don't use your freedom as an opportunity to gratify the flesh. Don't look for uh, the easy way. Oh, and if you go on biting and devouring one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. Pope Benedict once said, the world offers us comfort, but we're not made for comfort. We're made for greatness. He says, Christ did not promise an easy life. Those who desire comforts have dialed the wrong number. Rather, he shows us the way to great things, to the good, toward an authentic human life. Jesus calls us to follow him. But as any experienced disciple knows, that way of following him is not always an easy or a short way. Jesus can't promise us any shelter, any place to lay our head, any comfortable feather pillow. All he can promise us is his own breast to lay our head on and so we get close to take shelter in his sacred heart, that heart that's beating with love for each one of us, that heart that is there for us. No matter how far away we've wandered, Jesus is there ready to invite us back into the Father's love. Jesus can't promise us any comfort, any food. There might not be a Chick-fil-A along the way, but he does promise us the bread we receive here in the Eucharist, our daily bread that is our food for the journey and that is enough to sustain us if we place our trust in him. Jesus can't promise it's going to be an easy or a short way, but he does promise us that if we resolutely set our face to following him, and follow him to the end, then we will find life at the end of our journey. Dear parents and godparents, through the sacrament of baptism, the child you have presented is about to receive from the love of God new life by water and the Holy Spirit. For your part, you must strive to bring her up in the faith so that the divine life may be preserved from the contagion of sin and may grow in her day by day. If your faith makes you ready to accept this responsibility, renew now the promises of your own baptism, reject sin, profess your faith in Christ Jesus. This is the faith of the church, the faith in which this child is about to be baptized.
And so please respond, I do, as your faith makes you ready. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his empty show? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? This is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And so is it your will that we baptize Josephina in this faith that we have just professed with you? Josephina Marie, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.